you all for joining us. Um, today we really do have a rare pleasure of welcoming two giants in the field uh, to Columbia. Uh, you know, last fall during the advanced urban planning and historic preservation studio, the Alabama African American Civil Rights Heritage Sites Consortium based at the Birmingham Civil Rights Institute was a key partner that really enabled us to carry out uh, very ambitious work in Montgomery. Uh, first, a shameless plug that, that studio report has <laughs> just now turned into a physical form. Eric, I don't know if you'd like to say anything more about this. It'll be online yeah. shortly. It'll be online shortly, so that's good news. Um, so, please, if you care to join me oh. over here, yes. Georgette, are you coming up as well? No, I don't really like that. That's good. Back All right. Well, I have with me here uh, Priscilla Cooper, uh, who has has been the project leader on this remarkable effort to connect a series of civil rights sites uh, around the state of Alabama. Um, in over the last two years, the Educational Foundation of America, the World Monuments Fund, Jane Catherine Fund have been supporting this work, and today she will tell us, you know where they have been and where they are going. Um, but you know, you should all know about uh, Priscilla, that she served as um, the interim director of the Birmingham Civil Rights Institute. She was the vice president for institutional programs. She was instrumental in making sure that the whole district in Birmingham um, was nominated and secured the status as a national uh, monument. Uh, and then, then, you know, sort of, looked forward to spending more time with their grandkids I, and, and came um, out of retirement to spearhead this new effort uh, and we are really privileged to have her with us today. Tomorrow evening, for those of you uh, who haven't heard, the World Monuments Fund will be hosting an event at the Time Center at 6.30 p.m. where they will be sharing the oral history component of their work with a broader audience. Uh, so if that's something of interest, you can come up to me afterwards and we can try to connect you to that. Um, and with that, uh, thank you for being here, Priscilla, and we look forward to hearing Thank you, Will. I think you can hear me fine, right? Yes. 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 Okay. <laughs> uh, I do have brochures with me. Oh, yeah. Here. Let me pass let me this out. <laughs> I want to make sure others get it. As those are going around, when you think about civil rights and places that you associate with civil rights, um, particularly communities, tell me one that you think of when you think of civil rights activities in this country. A place. They made a movie, <laughs> it's a big bridge. <laughs> so, so thank you. <laughs> uh, another place. Washington. Washington? The March on Washington. Oh, okay. I'm okay. Gonna watch it. <laughs> yes. Okay, well I can see we have some an opportunity to introduce you to yeah. uh, some of that history. We laugh about this, or, this, this organization, group collaboration, having such a long name. Uh, but I wanted to share with you why we haven't figured out another way to say it. Uh, African American, these sites are all sites that were developed by and for the African American community. There are other civil rights sites, uh, particularly bus stations, seem to be the ones uh, that were that were not. You know, they, they were the site of civil rights events or activities, but they were not places that actually birthed and nurtured this movement. So, African American talk was important. Alabama, because we do view, view Alabama as the cradle of the movement. And it's the state that has actually uh, three cities that were pivotal in changing national legislation, and they are Montgomery, 
Birmingham, and Selma. So again, Alabama, African American. Civil rights, even though one of the things that we're talking about is the legacy of these sites is much greater and longer than what we traditionally think of as the civil rights era of the 1950s and 60s. Civil rights is how the general public, the broad community, the tourism industry, even preservation, that's how they identify these sites. So that was important. Heritage, because their heritage is deeper than those 10 to 20 years. We wanted to, to put heritage in there. Sites, they are buildings. Consortium, we are collaboration. So if you think of a shorter way to say all that, please, tell us. please share that with me. And this is um, you know, a little illustration because we have people who come to visit and really don't realize there's a lot of distance between these places. Uh, and each community is very different, which has made our work even more interesting. It's a challenge. Uh, Birmingham, and you can't really envision this in the context of the entire state, but Birmingham uh, is to the is the farthest north. Since all of these places are kind of in the middle of the state, Alabama is a really long state. Um, Montgomery is so Birmingham is the biggest um, city in Bur in Alabama as of right now. Uh, has an industrial history, which is very important in how things evolved there. It now has moved into education and service with the University of Alabama at Birmingham being the largest employer in the state. So it's changed dramatically. Montgomery is the capital of the state of Alabama, which makes it very interesting, unique uh, in its own way. It also is the site of the first White House of the Confederacy. Uh, so that juxtaposition of civil rights and confederacy. Uh, Selma, so Birmingham and Montgomery is about 90, 100 miles apart, about an hour and a half drive. Um, if you're going from Montgomery, Whitehall is a really small community and it's part of the Black Belt. It sits between Montgomery and Selma. We'll see the site when I go through the slides. Uh, if, have any of you heard of the book Bloody Lounge by Hassan Jeffries? Hey, mm -hmm. That's it. <laughs> that's Lounge County. Um, and then Selma, um, which of course, the, the movie Selma raised it to prominence, but people know about, about Selma. But Selma, Selma, uh, is a more of a rural community. It was the largest city in the Black Belt and faces some unique challenges. Greensboro is also part of the Black Belt. Really small community with a site that is very significant. And Georgette will be talking. I'm going to give you an overview of the consortium, what it, how it came to be and what it does, and then Georgette We'll talk more about efforts around re revitalization and redevelopment. And I wanted to be sure to put this slide in because it is the people who make the consortium what it is and have made it such a great success. The consortium started when the Educational Foundation of America approached the Birmingham Civil Rights Institute about uh, nominating, actually specifically, Selma sites to the World Monuments Fund watch. Um, we weren't familiar with the World Monuments Fund, we weren't familiar with EFA, or the watch. And we learned uh, that the World Monuments Fund primarily works overseas, and that's why we weren't as familiar with them. Uh, so, Georgette agreed to serve as historian and, and pull the necessary documentation together for the nomination, and the first thing she said was, we can't just talk about self. If we're going to talk about civil rights in Alabama, we have Birmingham and Montgomery, so the, um, the focus of the application broadened. 
We had a convening before the application was submitted, and it was obvious from that meeting, and the energy at that meeting has carried over. People were excited that somebody cared. These are places that are significant, most of them unknown, all of them operating with very limited resources. And I, what I say is these people, all volunteers, who've been laboring in the vineyard to preserve not only the places, but their stories for decades. You know, how long ago was 1965? 1960, you know. Um, and nobody seemed to care. So that was the first thing that they were just excited that somebody wanted to know what they were doing and hear their stories. And as we came together and, you know, we would sit, sit at a conference table, <clears throat> some of the things that emerged from that conversation was the need for preservation, and again, not just of the buildings, but also of the stories. Um, they really wanted oral histories because, as you can imagine, the civil rights de uh, generation is aging, or as I say, if we have somebody under 50 at our meetings, you know, that's a young person. Uh, so, uh, capturing that while those people were still available to tell those stories firsthand, and to be sure the stories were available for future generations. In future generations, getting that next generation involved and excited and becoming advocates for preservation of these sites and telling those stories. Those were kind of the three things uh, that rose to the top. We heard some wonderful um, stories and accounts from the people in the room about things they had experienced and why their sites were important. But it became clear that all of them shared some common needs, common missions. So even before, uh, I think the application went in in February, we wouldn't know until September uh, about the nomination, but e even before we knew these sites would be selected, um, we talked to the Educational Foundation. They agreed to support a needs assessment so we could figure out exactly what the sites needed. And the consortium operates from a position of what I call collaborative leadership, we respond to what the sites need. We are not trying to develop a template, you know, everybody will do this in 2020 and everybody will do this, because they're at varying stages uh, in their development. The other thing that Georgette and I uh, shared a concern about is what I call the mythology of the movement. When you think of the civil rights movement, what names do you think of? Uh, Rosa Parks, Martin Luther King, Martin Luther King, Jones. Yep. Um, Jones. And John Lewis. John Lewis. John Lewis. Oh, I'm so glad you know John Lewis. He's from Selma. Uh, but you know, I, I I say the popular narrative is He's from Troy. Rosa. Uh, Troy. He's from Troy. Okay. See, that's not how we are it was a home and rule album. <laughs> uh, then the popular narrative is kind of like Rosa Parks sat down, Dr. King stood up, and I was right with the world. Mm -hmm. You know, everything. Um, and the story is so much richer and so much deeper and so much longer than that. So it's really the people um, that make this project work. And I just want to briefly share with you some of the sites. We're going to start in Montgomery. Where are we starting in Montgomery? Y'all know how this is the state capital. No, we're starting in Montgomery because Montgomery was the site of the bus boycott that many of you as the initial major first campaign of what we refer to as the modern civil rights movement. <coughs> I'm going, I'll go back to that one. In each city, there are some places that have become iconic. In Montgomery is Dexter Avenue King Memorial Baptist Church, where Dr. King was pastor during the bus boycott. And the parsonage, um, which is where the family lived and was bombed um, during his work there. 
so that's the avenue. The Benmore Hotel was a place of lodging, so we have 20 sites uh, within the current class of the consortium. Uh, most of them, 75% of churches. Why do you think that is? Were the community hubs. Um, they were the community hubs. They were the community hubs. This is where, and this is the history that we hope to be able to share. Um, many of them, most of them started, um, one was pre-Civil War, and most of the rest of the war, either during the Reconstruction era or the very early 20th century. So they had a long history of being uh, the catalyst for community growth education, economic, social services. The Ben Moore uh, provided lodging during the era of segregation and it also became a community hub. And since you're interested in preservation, this is one of the sites we're most concerned about. Um, it's privately owned. I've learned a lot about the challenges of privately owned property when you're doing this work. Um, has been Abandoned for about ten, ten more years. Ten more years. Uh, the reason we have the Marlin Brothers Barbershop is that that barbershop still operates. That's where Dr. King used to get his haircut. Um, but that's the only thing in that structure that is still operational, and that's one we're really concerned about. And it sits in a very important. African-American historic area, uh, Centennial Hill, which you will read about in this report. <laughs> uh, the Dr. Richard Harris house, this is a private home, but fortunately this family is very excited about its role as part of this history and this legacy and excited about sharing it. Unfortunately, the matriarch of the family passed a couple of weeks ago, but her daughter is our contact in the expression. Uh, this is where John Lewis and other freedom riders um, hit out for protected after they were attacked at the bus station uh, in Montgomery as part of the freedom rides. And Valda uh, shares the upstairs room where they all sat, and then the upstairs, upstairs room where <laughs> young people were not allowed to go. First Baptist is also in Montgomery. Um, it's called the Brick of Day Church because when the old church was destroyed, the pastor said, well, on your way to, to church, you're going to pass construction sites and other sites and just bring a brick with you. And when you <laughs> see it, uh, so people bought a brick of day. And, and when you actually, I don't know if you can really tell here, but sections of the church, the brick is different. Uh, in different sections of the church. Uh, Reverend Abernathy pastored here. This is another church that was under siege uh, during the movement. And it's really just beginning to embrace its heritage and see the value of it. But we're really excited because one of the keys, people always ask, but how did you pick those sites? <laughs> well, they were African-American, I knew that. But also there had to be someone at least one person who was a steward of the site, who would come get information, who would share information, who wanted to move it forward. And again, as you were looking at community revitalization, community development, having key community stakeholders is essential. Uh, Jackson Community House, when I first uh, went to this um, facility. I thought we were in the wrong place because when you pull up on the street, there are all these state, I told you it's the state capitol, so it's surrounded by all of these state buildings, you know, uh, the concrete and glass <laughs> office buildings, and there's a tremendous story about um, the successful fight to keep um, state government from taking it over. Um, but it uh, was owned by the Colored Women's Clubs. And if you're not, if you've heard of the National Council of Negro Women, this was a local chapter of that. It was a home of many activities, but the first library, library 
for African Americans in Montgomery and the first licensed librarian of any race in the state of Alabama. Um, Mount Zion, only two, uh, with the exception of two churches, and this is one of them, the churches that we're working with still have active congregations. So they're still having church service there and hosting tours and trying to figure out how to save their buildings and their stories. Um, they call this the Memorial Annex because this is the historic building. Um, now Zion uh, tells the story, and it's true, I don't want to, of, of it being the location of the organization of the uh, Montgomery Improvement Association. Isn't, isn't that one in New York that's connected to Frederick Douglass? I'm sorry? I think there's one in New York and it's connected to Frederick Douglass actually used to preach. Uh, 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 there's a what in? A Mount Zion. Um, oh, Mount Zion is very common. Yeah, it's, I think it's called Mother Zion and it's in Harlem. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. Frederick Douglass. Yeah. Some, some of those, I'm sure you're correct. You know, some of the names you'll see in every community, you'll see a Mount Zion. Yeah, I'll go to Richard Allen in the the Zion, because he gets confused with the AME. Right. And then the AME Zion. And yeah. we have some that are AMEs, and there's a meeting. It's like, you know, we a Zion. Right, we're <laughs> AME Zion. I'm still yeah. learning exactly what that means. <laughs> <laughs> African Methodist Episcopal Zion. Uh, another AME Zion. And it seems in Montgomery, there's a real, um, preponderance, if you will, of AME Zion churches. This one um, is an example of not only the architecture, but the role that uh, these places played in education. Because when Alabama State University moved to Montgomery, this church hosted their first graduation. They hosted a lot of uh, very important speakers, including President McKinley. With President McKinley. Um, I still refer to it as Trinity Lutheran. This is a church, uh, actually in Georgia Jets neighborhood, that was pastored uh, by a white minister and it was a black congregation. He became very active in the movement, was secretary of the MIA, uh, and his house was closed. And this is the parsonage that was <coughs> Birmingham, also known as Birmingham. Um, the Ballon House is unique in our sites. Um, I like them because they are committed to interpreting that story of Black Birmingham prior to the movement. Black Birmingham is a post-Civil War city um, established in 1871. So there was a long history in Birmingham that people don't know and don't celebrate, and the Ballot House is committed to that. But also, even though it's very close to the uh, Civil Rights District and National Monument, it's not included in, in it officially. Uh, it's privately owned, but again, the owners are committed to preserving it and telling the story. Um, the Hamilton family, the Ballard they built the house, but the, the Hamilton family uh, during the Civil Rights Movement, Dr. H Herschel Hamilton, was known as the dog bite doctor. Uh, the Kelly Ingram Park, where the demonstrations were, is maybe three blocks, three or four blocks from the Battle House, and so people who were injured during the demonstrations were brought there for him to take care of them. Uh, Bethel, how many of you have ever heard of Fred Shuttlesworth? This is a student of my little story. I'm kind of cheating because I'm from Birmingham. Oh, you oh, are cheating. <laughs> I didn't answer other questions earlier. Okay. Well, honestly, uh, this is my opinion. Before the Birmingham Civil Rights Institute opened, a lot of people knew nothing about Fred Shuttle's work. And Fred Shuttle's work was the leader of the Birmingham movement. Uh, who his colleagues described as so crazy. He was, he was so courageous, they thought he was a little crazy. Um, and, you know, went through being attacked by a mob when he tried to integrate a high school with his children. 
Uh, the parsonage was bombed, the church was bombed, um, and as somebody pointed out to me, Birmingham, as I mentioned, was an industrial place. So people had access to dynamite. Mines, mills, when you think, well, why would they bomb? You know, but they had access to dynamite. 16th Street is the iconic church. How many of you heard of 16th Street as <laughs> church? Tell me why. Not you, Mr. Barnett. Yeah. <laughs> we, we went there on a civil rights trip in eighth grade, so uh, we went to Birmingham and saw that in Montgomery. What do you remember about 16th Street? Uh, the, the window in the, um, I think it's like a rose window, it was given by the children of, from Wales, but also I think this was a church where there was a bomb in the basement as well, mm -hmm. and maybe that was why the window was redone. Yeah. Uh, in Septem on September 15th, 1963, if you've heard of four little girls, this is the church uh, that was bombed and four uh, young girls were murdered. Um, and that, uh, it was an active civil rights church. Somebody mentioned the March on Washington. And what um, I like to share is if you can imagine the March on Washington, they have never been that kind of crowd on the mall. Dr. King was eloquent, the energy was great, all races, ages were there, and it just felt like such a high point, and this was in August uh, of 1963. September 15th, the Klan sets a bomb, kills four girls worshiping in a church. It was devastating. It was devastating and drew, once again, global attention to this whole issue of racial segregation um, and the violence that accompanied it. And, you know, a lot of people s repeat the quote, if you don't know your history, you're doomed to repeat it. You heard that. My position is if you don't know your history, you don't understand your present. So if you don't know about this legacy of truly domestic terrorism, it didn't just start 10 years ago, then you don't understand some of the reaction, the concern uh, that people have when we see similar things cropping up today that are rooted in a very similar philosophy of that young somebody. Uh, old Sardis, um, there's another church that uh, is just beginning to tap into its civil rights history. Uh, the Alabama Christian Movement for Human Rights was organized there, even though Reverend Shuttlesworth was pastor of Bethel. This church sits two blocks from a Jewish cemetery. Don't ask me. Uh, and so, you know, they felt that this was safer because nobody really knew they were there. Nobody, you know. Um, St. Paul sits directly across the parking lot from 16th Street and had felt like a stepchild, a movement stepchild for years because 16th Street gets all the visitors, then the Birmingham Civil Rights Institute opened right across the street, they got all the visitors, and nobody knew about St. Paul. Uh, St. Paul actually trained a lot of the young people who participated in the demonstrations Selma the Black Belt. If you saw the movie Selma, Brown Chapel is where the marchers left from. Uh, that's the iconic site in Selma. First Colored Baptist Church um, with First Baptist in Montgomery, First Baptist in Selma, and several of the other churches grew out of white congregations that required their, their black congregants even worship upstairs in the back. Um, this is another church. It was devastated. This is an old photograph. It was devastated by a tornado. Uh, another common challenge is that these congregations are aging and their numbers of members are dropping. Uh, and so I think First Baptist in Selma has particularly suffered from that. And um, the woman that we work with there is a longtime uh, black pres preservationist champion, which she reminds us sometimes. Uh, but just, you know, she's, she's been toiling a long time 
but her church is struggling um, around renovation, rehabilitation, and just really how it's going to move forward. This is another privately owned property, but this is the home uh, where Dr. King and other uh, global leaders visited and stayed during the Selma voting rights campaign. And this is where um, King, where they have a photograph of Dr. King watching um, Bobby Kennedy make an announcement and um, where he took a telephone call. So this was really this home. The family history is fabulous. They have such deep roots in Selma, physician, uh, open, a, a relative opened the first hospital, had the first pharmacy, all of those things. Uh, but again, it's a privately held property. So we'll see. Uh, tabernacle, somebody mentioned, Tabernacle's another common name. The, I go to a tabernacle, but it's in Birmingham. Um, this church is so beautiful. It is so beautiful. I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't bring any interior shots. But one of the things this church is famous for is it's the church with two entrances because black people were not allowed um, to enter and exit on this street, on this main street in Selma. So it's built, uh, it was designed with two entrances. They're exactly the same. Um, and that gives you a sense of the depth of the racism and, and segregation. The safe house is in Greensboro. I'm trying to check the time. I'm going to talk a lot about this. The safe house is in Greensboro, Alabama. Um, the Burroughs family, Dr. King was working in that area. They got word that the Klan had planned to uh, assassinate him as he was trying to leave. He hid out in this home, the, the wood structure. Um, he hid out there. Um, they were able to get him out of Greensboro safely. Two weeks later, he was assassinated in Memphis. Uh, the Jackson family took in the SNP workers who were there for voter registration. Um, and this is where they stayed. And there's also a dog track, which I'd never heard of until Georgette explained to me what it was. But it's a, a, it's a little two, adjacent two-room building. Um, again, this is another family-owned property, but Mr. Jackson really values it. But what happens when something happens to Mr. Jackson? So part of our work is trying to get that next generation engaged and excited um, about continuing that legacy. Uh, thanks, and I'm going to go through these quickly because this is really Georgette's area. <laughs> but I do want to share a little bit of what we, so you heard about the sites. We've been doing a lot of work. Uh, documentation has been key, and the JM Capital Fund has really supported this work. Um, on another document, I said, when is historic preservation a radical concept? And it's radical when you are preserving the sites and the stories of people whose history has been undervalued and overlooked, as is the case with African American history. You know, we weren't included in that big wave of American preservationism, if you will, and now some funders are kind of, oh, we don't, you know, we don't support historic preservation. And um, my reaction was, as soon as we walk in the door, it closes. But anyway, so it's very important uh, to train these sites. One, I'm convincing them that their documents are important. That's a big deal. Uh, and then helping them know how to collect. And, and so that's, uh, that's what this particular workshop was about. The uh, oral history project that Uh, Rachel, that <laughs> will mention, and you know, technology is great, but with this trouble, yeah, I'm trying to go. It might not work. 
<laughs> we'll give you the website. Okay. Okay. Uh, go tomorrow night and see Yes, come yeah. tomorrow night and you'll see it in all its glory. Uh, but the World Monuments Fund did support us doing oral histories. Each site picked their interviewee, so we didn't tell them who to pick. We gave them some broad criteria. Um, and Georgette wound up stepping in and, and being the interviewer for most of them, and that was pure providence because she knew the questions to ask. And had we used someone else, the interviews probably would not have been as rich, so I just have to uh, say that. Alabama Public Television partnered with us and did the recording. World Monuments Fund is editing, has edited them uh, and is launching a micro site with all of the interviews. Um, again, <laughs> Will Reynolds, he's been our champion, connected with us with the National Park Service. I know all of you are familiar with the Historic American Building Survey. <laughs> okay. Uh, our HABs. Uh, so they sent um, the HABs photographer to document all 20 of our sites. We didn't realize that this was the first time this equipment had been used anywhere. So if you look, the image on the left shows you the richness of what Jared was able to do for HABS, as opposed to excellent professional photography. But the HABS photographs look like paintings. It's the most amazing thing, and we are waiting to get all of them. <laughs> um, ah, who's in that picture? <laughs> this is uh, Will with students from Tuskegee. We have built uh, a partnership with um, Tuskegee University just started a historic preservation program in its School of Architecture, the first one in the state of Alabama. So, and you know, Tuskegee's an HBCU, right? Okay. <laughs> um, and this is Jira and Will. <laughs> Again, you can really see the difference in the quality of the photographs. And we had Columbia University students in Montgomery. None of them are in here, right? One, okay. sure. Oh, what is here? Uh, so you might have some questions for her when we finish. Uh, this is a workshop we did at Tuskegee with Tuskegee University Historic Preservation students and faculty. And now I turn it over to my colleague, Georgette. Write down all those questions you have the <laughs> Q&A. I'm going to be a little different because it's important for me that you understand the quietness of this. I traveled over to a distant town. I could not find my mother. I could not find my father. I could not hear the drum. That comes from Derek Walcott's Dream of the Memory. Priscilla has told me about the sites and we've seen them. And it's extremely important that we kind of understand why it is really important to restore them and to preserve them. We must leave evidence. Evidence that we were here that we existed, that we survived, and loved, and made. Evidence of the immense sense of fullness we gave each other. Evidence of who we were, who we thought we were, who we never should have been. Evidence for each other that there are other ways to live, past survival, past isolation. I stand before you, a survivor of the black southern woman, born, reared, and now again living in the land of civil war and civil rights, Montgomery, Alabama. My memories are struggle and reassurance, hard work and reward, hope and renewal, empowerment 
but people who lifted themselves out of a mind of apathy, complacency, and industrial bondage. And through ideological reorientation, redress the ills of previous generations. The history of my people in this country is replete with substitutions which stripped us of our history and culture, sense of identity, pride, and the individual work. But that history did not define us as people. The Montgomery of my youth was a community with a plethora of homes and black-owned businesses. In their places now stand abandoned buildings and bigger lots, ghostly ragged relics of a bygone era. The death rolls came with integration, urban renewal, and displacement. This brings us to why we're here today. Ours is a shared history that reflects and affects us in all myriad ways. To often our evidence seems a history belonging only to blacks or not relevant to the present. I contend we need new language and to move from civil rights to sites of conscience, connecting past struggles to today's issues and turn memory into action. Today, Alabama, we have conflicts with history, intellect, versus memory, remembrance. The need to remember often competes with the equally strong pressure to forget. Best intentions to turn the page after deeply divided events, erasing the past, have prevented generations from learning critical lessons and destroyed opportunities to build an inclusive both and narrative. We can no longer afford to simply glorify the actions taken during the tumultuous period of incivility. Civil rights history begins with questions of identity and membership. It moves to an understanding of the role of citizen, the fragility of democracy, the ways of prejudices, and the dangers of resolving complex problems by dividing the world into us and them and then blaming them for the ills of the society. It's a history that also raises profound questions of right and wrong, of guilt and responsibility. The consortium sites illuminate historical political roots of democracy and their impact on citizenship and current social economic issues through a variety of lenses and lead with a commitment to community action. The narrative needing the most corrective work for consortium sites is reinterpreting a place called home. Multiple identifications define home, the place depending on our interior and exterior landscape. Home for blacks is informed by ancestral roots, R O O T S, and traveled roots, R O U T E S. Blacks have experienced re repetitive, coercive upheaval or serial forced displacement, life interruptions due to actions by vigilante groups, federal law, state, as well as local government policies. Race, displacement, and exploitation are the hallmark of the black experience in this country shaping the black man's definition of home. Memory, especially in a black sense, is shaped by legacies of injustice occurring at the intersection of the subjective memory of trauma and the collected remembrances of histories of domination. Given the changes resulting from the historical amnesia and the elusive quality of communal memory, tackling this elephant is a daunting, but daunting task. But the Alabama African American Civil Rights Heritage Sites Consortium <laughs> gives us a starting point. All 20 sites are in areas affected by displacement, replacement. This is 
displacement from my ancestors began with the forced migration and enslavement became Syria and shattered a sense of home. Attempts to find home after one is forcibly given out is one of the recurring threads in considering the complexities of home. Africans captured and brought to the U.S. spent the better part of 200 years waiting for the U.S. government to begin the process of allowing them to call America home. Even after being emancipated from slavery, they still needed an additional 100 years before they could stake a claim to be to the moral conscience of the country during the civil rights movement. Throughout American history, unwelcome spaces to persons of African American descent were designated as white spaces. White spaces were therefore home to whites, where blacks and other non-whites attempting to gain entry were made to feel unwelcome, not at home, and could be accused of trespassing. It is important then that we begin to examine the issues around land, identity, economics, and decisions that were made regarding people and their choice or lack of choice in relation to their displacement. This involves not only physical and geographic displacement, but also the displacement of the soul. Serial forced displacement sets up a dynamic process that includes an increase in interpersonal structural violence, an inability to react in a timely fashion, to patterns of threat or opportunity, and a cycle of fragmentation. Each time black people in this country were displaced and began to resettle, a new mechanism came forth to bring unrest to their souls. You are not one of us. You don't belong. And once again, they face another displacement. Every displacement has brought disruption, representing definitive and cultural pervasive features of the black experience. Identities have been and continue to be challenged and transformed by these displacements. We will clearly begin to understand and recognize what the writer Charles W. Chestnut develops in his writings, Travel as Metaphor, as he explores the tension between roots and roots. Racial issues embedded in each displacement. Travel is mobility and offers a potentially liberating experience. But the threat of rootlessness and of deferred sense of community remains. While we, while the consortium does not have all the answers, we know enough to recognize that urban renewal introduced drastic changes in the U.S. urban landscape and affected the black population significantly. Residents, although not blind to problems, thought their communities as vital, exciting places. They not only knew the people next door, but in the next block, the next block, three streets over, etc. Yes, it was segregated, but we played, had a sense of belonging, and felt safe. It was a neighborhood. People knew your name and your family. We lived together, often for generations, with strong ties to one another. Neighbors depended on each other in times of need as well as in times of joy. They developed social, religious, and political organizations. They had businesses, bottle shops, grocery stores, gas stations, pharmacies, schools, shoe shops, sweet shops, etc. The importance of community to its members was heightened by the second prime citizenship the members endured in the rest of the city. Within their own communities, people had a sense of pride and accomplishment. They invested in their homes and supported their businesses, and many accumulated significant financial capital. In 1949, the renewal authorized the seizing of land using the powers of eminent domain in areas deemed blighted, code word for black. It is estimated that some 600,000 black people were displaced by this program losing not only their financial investments, but also their collective accomplishments, weakening businesses, 
institutions and relationships. The cumulative effects of this serial displacement, tormented by vigilante groups, urban renewal, and so forth, has greatly contributed to black, to black disintegration, undermined individual and collective functioning, and created immeasurable unrest to the soul of a people. When such bonds are ruptured, people lose their ability to control crime, and criminal activity begins to feed on itself, producing more disorder, and communities descend into a spiral. And that goes on for decades, and we've seen it more and more today. Our more perfect union is still generations, it seems, in the future. We are still bound by spoken and unspoken rules that make home and displacement two of the most contested arenas of black human experience. In the absence of economic reparations, urban reform, and global governmental and judicial reconciliation, what can we do? What does society do about this serial displacement? And what is a people's soldier? Do they find songs of home? The history of forced movement of people within the United States is a history informed as much by race as it is by culture, as much by financial expediency as it is by moral obligation. What does one do when home is no longer the same? The consortium is not about only about restoration and preservation of edifices, but about the soul of a people, paying homage to those who have the vision, the fortitude, and will to build an anchor community, which our sites represent. It enables us to make history work for cohesion rather than division, and our current generation grow up with an accurate, healthy understanding of their past and empowered to engage in civic life with votes to speak truth to power. The biographies of existing African American buildings and those demolished must be recognized, preserved, and their stories told. When buildings are demolished to fall down, vanishing from the landscape, too few, if any, know the loss. By documenting these histories, we attend to the living wounds under their patchwork quilt of scholars. Black life will be construction and the West Bell is barely a footnote in our history books or the consciousness of other Americans, even blacks. The absence helped to create a unique black American narrative, which emphasizes victimization, quietly in the background of every conversation we have about black people, even when it is not fully articulated or thought. It is our starting point, our agreed upon premise, our most articulated presupposition for dialogue. When we hear only a single story about a people, we create a serious misunderstanding. There's power in a singular story. It creates stereotypes that become the definitive story. And when you hear it long enough, you become the story. The consortium sites are important to the healing conversation of this country because they were the heart and soul of their black communities. As testament that one can rise above limited expectations and circumstances. They are citadels, footprints in what were established, thriving neighborhoods, destroyed by urban renewal highway systems, refusing to be silenced, holding stories of survival in the midst of a storm. And we, intended to know. Each building's narrative is a legacy of those who built, nurtured, and emboldened its members, 
and to provide the world a better understanding from whence the people came, to ignite the stoke, the fires that stoke the markets for rice and wheat. These consortium sites will use their authentic cultural voice to create a new, inclusive narrative that communicates from whence we come, who we are, and what we built. In telling a valid story, we reimagine our strength and realign ourselves to our history. While we preserve structures and their stories, we also preserve our soul, our essence. We must return and fetch that which we have left behind. Speak of words no textbooks read. Historic places have powerful stories to tell, but they cannot speak for themselves. That is up to us. Growing up in Montgomery, I remember love and belonging. Belonging to a family, a neighborhood, a community, to a people. I remember knowing that I was a tip of a spear with the shaft of my ancestors at my back. Today, we must continue that letting us know that we are not alone, that we are girded by our ancestors. It is now time for some honest dialogue where the hallmark is trust. Specifically, deliberative dialogue, which gives us the opportunity not only to discuss serial displacement, but to transcend what, is, what has become standard boundaries of race and space, and create the opportunity of creating restoration and reconnection to what once was. There are real fears. But we will aspire with the fortitude, the courage, steadfastness, clearness, and leadership of Nelson Manila Mandela, as well as his friends. In this way, we not only honor the life and living legacy of the ancestors who built but give them their right, rightly place in history. And together, honor the best democratic and libertarianist traditions in ourselves. We recognize, recognizing that black folk were not a burden. They left evidence. Thank you. Come on then. Let us go